Hello, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. So excited. My name is Jonah from Discover, and we are talking to Lane Johnson today. And before we get started, I just want to call out, I love everybody's already blowing up the chat. We got Bonjour from France. We got Hi from the Netherlands, from Indiana, from the UK, from Rome, a uh, fellow from Texas, because Elaine, I, I sounded like you were from Texas. Hello from Brazil, from Pakistan. This is wild. Uh, from Kansas. Wow. From we got the whole the whole world with us here today. From and Pakistan they, to Canada. From Pakistan <laughs> to Canada. <laughs> like a, like a Woody Guthrie song up in here. <laughs> uh, like I said, we are talking to Lane Johnson today, and we are going to be talking about how to jumpstart your paintings like a pro. Just want to set a couple expectations first before we start going, though. If you have to get up away from the computer or if anything is moving fast, please don't fret. There will be a replay available. It's going to be on the Discover page. It will also be on the YouTube page, and it will be emailed to you if you RSVP'd along with the course offer. Also, you're all very comfortable with the chat so far, so I doubt I need to say this, but feel free to hop in the comments. Let us know if you have any questions, something you're excited to learn, maybe where you heard about Lane or Discover. We love hearing all of that. And if you're watching the replay, please hop in the comments as well. We come back and love to hear what you all are talking about and saying. And uh, there will be a proper Q&A near the end. So we're going to try and answer questions as they come up. But if we don't get your question, just pop it back in the end when we're formally answering questions and we want to get to all of them. So proper introduction. We're talking to Lane Johnson and we're going to be talking about how to jumpstart your paintings like a pro. You're going to learn about Lane Johnson's four stage painting process for creating beautiful luminous landscapes. A little background on Lane through his video lessons on Instagram and his online art school. Lane Johnson has created a global community of more than a quarter million people who love cloudscapes, landscapes, and celebrating the beauty of nature through art. If you're familiar with Lane, you know he loves painting big, beautiful Texas landscapes and cloudscapes. Yeah. And yeah, I, Lane, I don't want to, well, I did want to just say a couple more. And since opening his first course on Teachable three years ago, more than 1,500 students have enrolled. Lane has also been, Lane will also be answering your questions. And he has a bundle of art resources for everyone. So please stick around until the end. And Lane, today we are doing a proper like demo, which I'm really excited for. So I don't want to take up any more time so we can get into it. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Joan. I really am really excited to be here today. Uh, nature, we had wonderful cool front blow through last night and it's beautiful outside right now. So uh, we go from big billowing clouds to clear blue skies. So it's mm. like that, it's in Texas. So before the demo, uh, let me tell you a little bit about how I got started uh, and how mm -hmm. my process has kind of evolved over time. I started painting really early, uh, about 12 years old. Uh, really, I my mom was painting paint by numbers of all things, and I did huh. a few of those. But then I, I thought, well, I think I could do better than that. I want to try something else. So uh, I actually started probably with Walter Foster books back then. Back then, there was no Internet. So, you know, I'm kind of old. So... But, uh, you know, later I formally trained in, uh, as a graphic designer and as an illustrator. Uh, when I was in college, first semester of painting, painting wasn't like it is nowadays. There was not really much representational painting. So I went a different route and learned lots about uh, composition and graphic design and became an illustrator, uh, which meant there was always deadlines, so many deadlines. You had to work fast. So over time, my, my technique has evolved kind of organically over the years. I mean, I've been using acrylics, watercolors, oils, finally, came back to oils about five years ago to paint, you know, fine art. So I actually discovered it, it was a classical technique. I never really knew it was. I was kind of just doing it in a hybrid fashion, so to speak. So these days I kind of teach in a four stage process, four. Uh, it's kind of a simple process, I think. It's the first thing is obviously drawing on the canvas. If you can see this one back here is what we're going to work on. 
that's the that's the first stage. I typically will use a grid and I will transfer my drawing that I've got, that I'm going to paint to the canvas. Simple, easy peasy. The second one is the underpainting. The stage two is creating the underpainting, and the way I like to do it is using an imprimatur and then a bister. And I'm going to show you that in a little bit. Uh, and that's really a critical part of uh, what we're doing when we get when we're jump starting a painting, because It'll, and I'll tell you a little more about that once we get this thing going. We got to get this thing started in a second. So, the third stage was blocking in and modeling form. Any of my students that are watching me right now, they they're going, yeah, yeah, we know this. The, the blocking in is critical. You're getting you're getting going in the painting, and then you start creating forms in the painting. The important thing is at that stage, you don't want to get locked down into details. So you need to keep pushing on until you get the whole painting pretty much blocked in and formed up really well. And then the final stage of painting, a lot of people may say it's the most fun part. It's the when you go in and add your final details. And, and then I say adjustments, because always I will come in, make some form of adjustment, either spatial adjustment or balance situation, whatever. But that's when you, at the very end, get to do that. And that's when all the pings and pops happen and the magic happens in the painting sometimes. So let me get going on this. Are we ready? Okay. Yeah. First of all, when you, when you do this, you need to be wearing rubber gloves. Okay. Uh, we're working in oils and we're going to be using Gamsol. And uh, I use my favorite color to use is uh, transparent earth red made by Gamblin. But very often, uh, a lot of people will use burnt sienna. Uh, any kind of earth tone will work. And depending on the kind of painting I'm doing, I may change the colors a little bit. For example, if I'm painting a nighttime painting, a nocturne, I will use other colors. So, anyway. And you can see, I don't know if you can see this, it's pretty red here. I'm going to start slathering it on. It's kind of messy, so you just have to bear with me here. In fact, I'm going to go to a bigger brush. Big boy. What we're doing here is uh, coating the canvas, basically. Uh, and it's important not to do this uh, too thinly uh, because you can actually not put enough pigment on the, on the surface of the painting and it can be, be can called uh, it's underbound. Basically, the paint's not wanting to stick. So you do have to have enough uh, paint coming down or you can add a little bit, a little tiny bit of oil or say like lick one to it. And that will give it when it needs to adhere well. There's actually oil in, you know, to the paint. So a lot of people don't use anything other than what's in the paint. And that's what we're going to do. It's not like it's windy outside here in Texas today. Cool front came in. Feels great in the studio. And this is great too. When you do this, uh, I'm using Gamsol because I think it's a perfect thing for this because it's not, it's not necessarily, in my opinion, the strongest uh, uh, solvent. It's a nice one for this because it's not, it doesn't remove everything so, so harshly. But this is the only stage I use it in because this is the petrochemical you know, type thing. And I've got the windows open, so we have lots of good ventilation right now. Okay. Probably throwing paint everywhere behind me here. It's not real critical that this is perfect. And that's one of the things, the way I like to teach too, is like, I like to teach in a technique that's that's more forgiving, so to speak. Something that's uh, oh, I just want to sleep. There it goes. Something that's uh, you know not going to you have to hit everything perfectly all the time. As you go along in the painting, you'll be able to adjust things or make corrections easy enough, and especially not rush. So uh, anyway, as you can see, I, I timed it pretty well. It's all out of here, perfectly in the mouth. And now we need to let it sit for a little bit. So. Let me get this out of my hand. 
Okay. Well, a lot of people ask me, why do you start with an imperatura? So it's kind of hard to explain. One of the things that Imprimatur do, it, it does, it does a lot of different things. Uh, I learned when I was illustrating that I would learn to put down a mid-tone of something. And it's almost in, in the same manner that you would, a pastel artist uses a toned piece of paper. Uh, but if you have the, the technically just this right here is the Imprimatur. You let it dry and then you just paint on it the way you normally would paint afterwards. But what I'm going to do after this dries a little bit I'm going to start rubbing out highlights. And I learned to do that as an illustrator. Uh, initially, I was using it with uh, gesso uh, paper with watercolor or gouache on there, and you could rub out this in the same manner. But uh, this is a really good technique. It's actually an old master's technique uh, that is very classical. So the other thing that it does, uh, and there, at the very end, you can get the, the free ebook. It explains all the technical parts of why it works in a certain way. It can create luminosity. Well, it's just something to do with, like, if you have a blue sky and you have this kind of color, these kind of colors are going to react to each other. So, in other words, if this blue sky is here, you might see little bits of imprimatur coming through even, and that gives you a color vibration, which is really dynamic. Uh, so it helps with luminosity, and it, it helps you get nice, bright colors. See, I already got my hands all messed up here. And also, uh, the other part is it, it's basically a tonal underpainting in the end. When we start rubbing out the highlights, that that starts creating some depth right off the right off the bat. But when you are when you finish the underpainting, in other words, you do just this color and right rub out the highlights. You can let that dry and then come back and add darker values, like from a burnt sienna, a pure burnt sienna, or burnt umber or even, you know, Van Dyke Brown, and then complete a, a complete underpainting. Uh, honey, can you give me that paint, the little painting right there, Sandra? More of a complete underpainting where you have darker values, kind of like this. Can you see it? Anyway, uh, that's what we're going to do in a little bit. Here. So how do you do that? Well, we do a Vista rub out. It's going to jump start the painting. And uh, let me show you an example painting I did oh, several years ago, actually. It's called Paradiso. Is that slide? Uh, no. no. We don't have that slide. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is get ready and start rubbing this out. Has it been dry on yet? Hmm? No, I'm going to tell you. And this is one thing you can do. Drying conditions will, will change and they'll depend on what your conditions are. A good example is right here today, a cool front just came through, my windows are open, the humidity has dropped and there's it's breezy and uh, the fan is nice and breezy. So it will dry differently than it would say like on a rainy day or even a cold day. In the same manner, if you were trying to do a lacquer finish on a piece of furniture, it, you they react differently in different uh, situations. So one thing you can do is just test it real quick. Uh, and sometimes what I do, I just make it even. So that's pretty good. I'm just gonna even it out a little bit. Do we have any questions? Yes, Jen. Yeah. Joe, well, do we you got... have any questions? Yeah, well, we have a we have a few. Uh, what did you use to do the sketch underneath, Victoria was asking. Ah, I use Conti pencils or Conti uh, pastel stick. Oh, okay. I know the next question. What's the next <laughs> How come question? it didn't disappear? Yeah, it didn't disappear because uh, I used basically workable fixative. You, you, you spray it with workable fixative and it'll prevent that from disappearing. Okay, okay. We, we got a now, few more another, questions. Oh. The, another thing that you can do if you don't want to use spray is rather than using a Conti pencil, 
just or you draw it out in a Connie pencil, but just take an acrylic pen or an acrylic brush and just go over your lines. And once that's dry, uh, well, on top of that, we'll look just like that. It's just a matter of if you if you can't take your stuff outside to spray it, uh, or you don't like spray, then you can do it with acrylics. Oh, that's so cool. So a few question. more questions if we got the time. Here. Yeah. Uh, have you tried out water water-based oils? If you have, which one do you prefer? I have, and <laughs> unfortunately, I'm very spoiled uh, on regular oils. Uh, once you paint in oils and then you try water-based, I haven't found a brand that's like, wow, this is just like oils. Uh, so I'm not a big fan, but if you've never painted in regular oils before and you come up on that and you like it, that's fantastic. Uh, I've painted in so many different medium uh, media over the years. Uh, I actually did lots of lots of acrylic paintings, and uh, you can actually start the painting in acrylics, and then go into oils later in the painting. So if you like the blendability of oils, but you like the quickness of acrylics, then you can do the two. But once you go from acrylics to oils, you have to stay in the oils. They right, then you're them. in. Oh, that's, that's cool. Uh, and then one more question just for the moment. Uh, why not use liquid white? Asked David. That's something that I think Bob Ross does. And that's a wet on wet <laughs> technique. Uh, the technique I, paint, I teach is not wet on wet at all. It is a, uh, this stage is the only wet stage. That's it. And it's transparent. Uh, uh. Whereas I think Bob Ross would use his white and then he would blend into it opaquely. Uh, this is more of a classical approach. Bob Ross followed more of a direct painting approach. Now, when I go outside to paint outside in plein air, I will paint directly too, but I will bring a panel that's already stained this color and dry. So I have uh, a mid-tone color that's already there, but I can't do a bister that way. Uh, so it's just the way you have it. I can't see it. Okay. Oh, cool. Yeah, if you look at the, uh, the, the screen there, uh, there's two paintings there. The, these are large paintings too, by the way. But, and if you saw the finished one in the end, you could go and find places in the painting that had the couverture uh, shining through a little bit, but you're allowing some of these colors. You're painting, you're asking about Bob Ross. Bob Ross painted directly and fast, okay, and it was done. Now, what, what I painted is layering. So you paint one thing down and then another thing down, and you can build up textures and you can build up colors in a way that Bob Ross never could or any people that's painting directly. It's just a different style of painting altogether. Like I said, if I'm painting outside, you have to because you're racing time. The sun's moving, the tide's moving, whatever, and you're racing. But working in the studio, we don't have to race. We can take our time and chill and paint in layers and have a good time. Awesome. Are, are we still waiting for things to dry? Do you want to answer a couple uh, more questions? Go ahead. Let's try it now. You've got a bunch more questions. Oh, I'll answer questions then. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Uh, well, in, in just a couple more relevant to to this stage. Was the okay. red paint thin? Thin, the red paint. What do you think of it? Oh, a Gamsol. Yeah, Gamsol. Oh. Gamsol is an old release mineral spirit. Uh, you can use any kind of paint solvent that you clean your brushes with: turpentine, uh, turpenoid. Uh, you can even use uh, lavender, uh, spike lavender. These things are all things that will dissolve oil paint, uh, you know, while it's wet. So, uh, like I said, Gamsol is one that I've used in the past, and it's, it's worked well. Uh, it's not as strong as some other things, which is why I like it. At a certain point, if this, this is stage. at this stage, at this stage only, when I'm painting every, everything else, I'm, I'm uh, cleaning my brush and using a, a lavender, spike lavender type products. It will clean the brush really well, and, and they're organic, so you don't have to worry about the petro, petrochemical part of it. Uh, I'm just showing you here real quick. I'm starting to pull out some highlights. And it's still a little wet, but that's okay. That's about right, I think. I'm going to start pulling these out. You can uh, keep asking questions. I, I am. Yeah. Uh, we got a question. Should Im, uh, should imprinter imprinter? Why well, I'm having a hard time with that word. Imprimatura <laughs> be 
Uh, I like this. A color theory question. Should it be blue, green, cold color if the resulting painting has more warm colors? Yeah, that's color theory stuff. Say that again. Do you want blue, green if it's going to be warm, if the painting's going to be warm? I don't know. Do I, don't, I don't paint warm paintings. So uh, and my, <laughs> I, this is typical for me with, with landscapes. If I right. were painting portrait work, then I probably would not necessarily use this technique. I might use a grisaille or a Verdaccio. Verdaccio type technique, which is different. Uh, but these warm colors are the ones that, uh, if you if you like blues and skies, they they work really well. If you look on Instagram right now, the painting I'm working on, which is over here, it's got a really uh, luminous sky going on in it, and uh, it's really uh, it, it excels at that type of thing. So uh, I'm going to continue doing this. Uh, yeah. If this dries too much, another thing you can do is just dip your, this, these are paper towels. You can dip it in the Gamsol and it'll wipe it. And it'll activate the layer again. You can continue wiping it. Oh, cool. So. Well, this is, but we're this, so just to clarify, we're only using the gamosol at this part of the process. Yes, if you okay. like gamosol, you can use it whatever, whenever you want. Honestly, yeah, it's starting to dry. So talk about bister. This is the bister technique. It's basically a rub out. Uh, I'm rubbing from into the wetness, and it's, this is actually just about ideal right now because you don't necessarily want to rub it off this pure white. Uh, you going to be painting on this after this is dry, you're going to be painting on it anyway. So you want to, some of that luminosity come through, and if you go to straight white right off the bat, then you kind of have defeated the purpose of it. So. This areas on, these areas on the outside will be painted blue, and I'm just going to leave them the color they are. Uh, typically on clouds, I just, I do that. Somebody's asking about your reference photo. Do you want to show that? Oh, uh, yeah. Here, you can show me. This is the reference photo. I actually did this in a 30 and 30 challenge, a small painting of this. And, uh, you know, it's a very typical kind of big cloud you see in Texas uh, in the summertime. Uh, it's funny because Google reminds you, you know, pictures from three years ago and, and Invariably, it's the same kind of clouds that were outside, you know, watching and taking pictures of for painting. So, there's, you just have to follow the rules, you know, of light, you know, and understand that a cloud is a form. You know, it's not, they are mysterious and they are ethereal. They're not just a normal form, but a lot of people forget that they are form and they tend to draw them as shapes too much. So, uh, and sometimes they need to be shapes. Uh, I talk about clouds in a cloud painting, or in paintings in general, as um, kind of like actors. You know, on, on stage you'll have your lead actor. In the case of this painting, this big cloud is the lead actor. In another painting, uh, kind of like the other one, it's the sky would be a supporting actor because the other parts of the landscape are going to be more important. So you have to kind of keep things balanced. Uh, to make sure that one thing doesn't overpower the other, or you want the balance to be, the focal point to be where it needs to be, where you want it to be. And sometimes if you create too many really interesting things, they can actually uh, fight each other, and your eye doesn't know what to look at. So, so tell me about the Waterburger water billboard. Oh, yeah, Waterburger. I did a, once, once I did a billboard for Waterburger, which is a hamburger company, you know, and it was a it, took, it was going to go in Galveston on, on a beach scene. So the there was a character that had a beach hat on and sunglasses and a big beach ball. And I learned a lesson that color is relative. And so I painted the guy's face in there and did the beach ball. And then I did the blue sky behind him. And suddenly the guy looked like he was sunburned like crazy. And so I had to repaint the guy. And I learned, well, you need to keep things in context in context and you need to pay attention to what's you know what's important. The face is important, so make sure it's reading off the right thing. So again you were probably painting off the white background. Yes, I was. I was painting off the white background. 
that was before I knew that. So back then, I was actually airbrushing. That was crazy. So uh, a lot of these air, these lines here. I'm going to do this right here. Let's see if you can see this. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's dry. So it's drying quicker. It's just probably because it's windy. I'm dipping my my cloth into some uh, my paper towel into some Gamsol. Ooh, look at that. It reactivates the color. But a lot of these lines that you see here are going to be painted in darker values. Uh, there are some uh, values that, like in this, the grass right here, you could wipe away like this. Uh, some over here. And again, this is just getting, a, getting your vision down a little bit ahead of time, jump starting your hand. So, it doesn't have to be perfect. Got to save some, uh, some fun for those wacky brushes that I use. The, uh, let's see, like, like this guy here. Called him my old soldier. He's been around the block. So again, if I dip this in, which I did there, I want a stronger highlight here. We'll do it. And it's funny, you have to keep you have to keep trusting this process because I will paint on something like this and think I've done the most horrible job and then come back. The next morning and go, where did that come from? I didn't know, I don't remember painting that. And it's just the nature of the day sometimes. You have to just do what you know works and then, you know. Any more questions? So why does this work? Hmm? Why does this process work? It's repeatable. For me, uh, I like using this process. It's if you if you I run into students or people I see people all the time. They get into a painting and they run into a problem and they don't finish the painting. They they don't finish it. They get stuck. And uh, you got to know if you find a process and learn it and practice it. Of course, you're going to get better at it. But the more of these successes that you have, these repeatable successes. Uh, the more happier you're going to be, number one, and, and you're going to be able to, you know, get better and better. I mean, that's the goal of, of it all is to get better. So how does this help you jumpstart? Hmm? How does this help you jumpstart your painting? This, it jumpstarts the painting because you're seeing values. Uh, when, you're, when you're seeing your values early, a lot of people, they forget and they go to color too soon. Uh, a, a painting needs to work in values before it needs to work in color, in my opinion. They, ultimately, they work together, but you've got to, you know, there's a reason why you see people squinting when they draw or when they're painting. They're trying to break down color to the values, to break it down to the, the basic shapes and the basic tones. And a, a tonal underpainting like this helps you to do that. Uh, you could do the same painting just like this in black if you wanted to, black or gray or whatever, and it would help you get get along the route on, on that, but it would not help you with the uh, luminosity part of it. Now, if you're doing that like a nighttime scene, that might be a good idea, some, some tonal grays, then you'll come back with blues on top of that, and then it could be a really nice uh, nocturne painting. So uh, that's a whole other Another thing. So that is when we use a blue. Mm -hmm. Well, I've actually done nocturnes using blues, greens, browns. And if you look through the history of nocturnes, in fact, my, on my course, I show a history of nocturnes. And the color palettes are all over the place on, on nighttime paintings. And that's what makes them very interesting. If they were all the same thing, then it wouldn't be as interesting. Right? Then we got a question here. Do you scrape out the mid-tone areas as well? Say again? 
Are you scraping out the mid-tone areas? Or the some, some of it, yeah. Some, some of it. Okay. Uh, you don't have to. I'm just uh, in the same way that I'm trying to translate a color image to tonal. Uh, some of these things will, like if this, I use this part of the, the, the cloth, it won't rub off very much at all. But if I go to the wet side, I'll get more highlights and be able to do. So what you're rubbing out is actually the highlights primarily. Primarily the highlight. Primarily the highlights is what I'm rubbing out. Uh, the midtone technically is this. Like I said, when I get ready to, do, to go ahead and do the finish the underpainting where I'm actually painting with darker colors, uh, that's the, the dark end of the values. So uh, again, these areas are not the strongest values as they will be in the final painting. But uh, I'm, I'm, I want to make sure I save some of that so that it's you know got the luminosity basically. And you can, when you build layers, they they it's rich. It's not just, well, here's a blue or here's a blue to bring together. You, 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 like if I'm doing grasses, I may start with darks and then midtones and then highlights and then come back with darks, midtones and highlights. And you get this tremendous, lovely uh, organic texture to it that's a rich experience when you see it. You know, if somebody says, I feel like I can just step into your painting, that's a good thing. So uh, I, I think uh, you just have to, it's just a different, it's a different style of painting that I, I I really enjoy. And did you use any walnut oil? Not in this. I uh, I have. You can use walnut oil in your imprimatur. Any kind of oil you can use linseed. Uh, but when you add oil, you don't want to necessarily add a ton of oil in the early part of the painting because you're 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 painting uh, fat over lean, which means lean lean means like this. Your thin thin layers, and as you get further in the painting paint thicker and thicker. So if you paint a lot of oil in the beginning, then subsequent layers are going to have a harder time bonding to the, the, the bottom layer and you can have some delamination. So it's just you know thin to thick. And so right this stage is, is the thin stage. And uh, like I said, walnut oil I have done in the past, it doesn't take very much, it's a little tiny bit. And that gives you a nice uh, bond. Any kind of oil you add into it though, now, I'm not talking about liquid. Liquid is technically considered an oil, if you want to think like that. But any kind of regular organic oil like linseed oil or like walnut, walnut oil will uh, slow the drying time down. So if anything, in the beginning of this stage, uh, and I did not on this, I will add a little bit of a liquid. And, and that will ensure that tomorrow morning when I want to paint on this, it will be dry and ready to go. But it doesn't take a lot. Like I said, there's already oil in paint tubes. So uh, you just have to make sure that you don't put it down too thinly. Now, surprised nobody's asked me about acrylics. We're waiting? OK. <laughs> anyway. Do you use liquid? I do use, use liquid. These days, I tend to use liquid fine detail a lot because I can keep it in a bottle. Let me see. So it's a. Model of liquid. Maybe blurry for them. Hmm? Maybe blurry. Oh. Liquid. There you go. You can see that. And, uh, but the original life is what I used initially for, for a long time. I still do. So. Hey, Jonah, any other questions? Yeah, we got a couple rolling in Don't here. Don't ask me what the airspeed of a swallow is. Because <laughs> I'll say African or European. Exactly. Uh, so there's a couple yeah, people are asking some more like color theory or tonal painting. So, uh, so is this part of the process the same as a tonal value study or tonal value yeah, painting? They're related, yeah, they are related. Uh, they basically, uh, yes, uh, because we're working one, one paint color, basically. Uh, if you're doing a tonal uh, value uh, study of something, you know, you'd just be using possibly a different color, like I said, a gray or black or whatever. Uh, and if you're using a gray, you, you probably put down a gray and then possibly rub out your highlights in the same manner and then add 
dark colors, dark black or whatever, as a monochrome uh, value study. Um, it's just, you could do the same study, not in this technique at all, with regular paint, using using white. We're not using white at all in this painting. So that's no, what I'm okay. saying. Not yet. No, no, yeah. That's at this stage, there's no white. Uh, it, whereas if you were doing another type of underpainting, like a... Um, Grisaille, yeah, you, you would, you could use white there. Uh, I just don't, I, I'm not a big fan of using white early in a painting uh, or detailing so early in the painting because you're locking down things and it kind of sometimes for students, it slows them down. You needed to keep going in the painting, get it done where overall it looks good, but now you can go back in and work the details, the details that need to be there. And sometimes it may be details that don't need to be there you need to go back in and knock things down so uh, you might have to use a glaze or something else to uh, tone down an area to make it more atmospheric so. mm. okay and then uh, kind of a follow-up there like does one need to know transparent color versus opaque or can you get the same results by adding oils you can get similar results like i said before i use transparent earth red i used burnt sienna and uh, the earth tones are generally transparent. They are. They're on the transparent. Sandra says they're on the transparent. She's an expert. She's, I don't know. Uh, the way, uh, that's what, the thing I always encourage my students to do, try experiment. You, you'll, uh, one of the fun things that I did in my last course was I did color uh, ex experiments and to see which colors we were going to use because it was a limited palette painting. And mm -hmm. uh, I chose, I did all these uh, color mixings and chose the, the few colors I was going to choose based on those observations. And anybody can do that. That's a good mm -hmm. way to learn about not just color mixing, but, you know, your color preferences. Uh, every artist, I think, has a, a preference of certain things that they like a lot and mm -hmm. some things they don't like. So uh, people always ask, well, what's your, what's your the big thing? It's like, what's your big thing? Because you're the one, <laughs> what's your big thing? You're the one that's going to be happy with your painting in the end. It's going to, and the same thing I told them on the teachable courses is, you know, this is where, this is the starting point. You can take what we're doing in the course, make it your own. You know, the, the important thing about the course uh, work is to learn something, to, to take something from what I'm teaching you so that your next painting is successful and the one after that. So uh, if, if, if I get that, then that's, I'm happy. Uh, like I right. said, you don't have to copy my painting. You, you should make it, you can copy the painting if you want. You can, you can uh, make it a little bit different if you want. And that's cool. Uh, just make sure that you try to follow what I'm doing to understand what I'm trying to teach. And then uh, I think that's the main goal. Yeah. Well, I love that, that approach too. I think it was, you know, I, I come from the musical discipline, but Neil Young, who was like, if you want to get good at writing songs, write songs don't write a you know yeah. don't <laughs> don't sit there writing one masterpiece you gotta just write an output yes. new and new and then you'll it, some at one point you'll start just writing good songs it used to drive me crazy my son was in high school and he, i tried to get him to draw and draw and draw and uh he could go here's my character same character every time again and again and again and like, Okay, that's okay. And guess what? He ended up going to SCAD and become an artist himself. And he's, so you never, you never know. But, yeah. Well, it, it uh, just relative it's to. Called, yes. I'm sorry. Oh, just relative to the walnut oil, quick before we, because there was a question about that. If you add yeah. too much walnut oil in the first step, is there something you can do to make sure the paints uh, that you apply later will bond properly? It wouldn't hurt to, after it's dry to touch with. If you added too much walnut oil, it may take a long time to dry. <laughs> so, but uh, if, it, but if it's dry, if, it, if you were to take some Gamsol or something and wipe it down, maybe, and it might remove any of the excess whatever. Uh, you, you just gotta. And this is another. I'm gonna get into oiling out because that's another thing. Uh, a painting does need to be healthy, so it does need to have the right amount of oil in the layers. And some colors automatically just want to suck in paint and uh, it becomes hmm. flat. So you do have to go in then with some oil or some liquid and then, uh, you know, oil it out, which means it adds that oil back in the layer. You add it down there and then you remove the excess. So whatever doesn't stick, you know, 
it comes off, which basically means the layer gets what it needs. So, and that's important. And it gets only what it needs. Whatever the excess is taken away. So, mm, okay, that's fantastic. fascinating. And then uh, another question here: Which colors do you use in the darkest tones of Imprimatura? Uh, I favor, uh, I don't go back and forth between burnt umber, uh, raw umber, and Van Dyke Brown. But I've actually, on one painting, I actually had leftover paint from a previous painting that it's the day before. I was like, okay, let's have some fun. And I put them all together and blended it up and it turned into a nice dark color. It's like, I'm going to try the imprimatur with this color. Or I'll do the dark parts of it with that color. And it worked out great. So, you know, have fun when you're painting. Experiment. Right, right. <laughs> But don't eat the paint. It's you know, oil paints perfectly right, safe. I'm wearing gloves. I'm wearing gloves not because of the paint, but because of the, the thinner. After right. after this stage, I wear gloves. So, and again, you know, Van Gogh would probably tell you, Van Gogh would say, "Don't eat the paint." <laughs> Bring a snack so you're not tempted. Yeah. You want you want white teeth? Don't use paint. Right. <laughs> And so this this phase here, you're. I love this. I'm I'm so very much not a painter, so I'm no. I'm, I'm asking outside of the expertise of the the entire audience here. But this always fascinates me. You're you're not just touching your highlights. You're working in the whole kind of highlight mid tone range, right? Mm -hmm. And you're able to right. that as well. Okay. So like I said, if 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 and I'll wait till tomorrow to do this or whenever. I'll let this dry. I could pick up this paintbrush right now and add color and start painting dark colors here. Uh, and I have done that at times, but there's no rush to. That's another reason why I like this technique is that it's very uh, forgiving. You know, you don't have to rush. You you do have to make sure you don't add too much oil in the beginning stage. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Right. I have a friend. Yeah. I had a friend that once said, I, hey, I did this painting. She's from church. And I said, oh, really? Tell me about it. And she said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go, well, what color was that? She goes, she said, it wasn't drying. And I said, well, what color was that? And she said, oh, there's in crimson. And I just buried my head. So it's not going to dry anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, some colors dry faster than others. And others are notoriously bad for slow drying. And she painted it very thickly. And she painted it thickly. So uh, anyway. That's okay. I'm always, let me, so there was still, uh, there was one more, I know, and I caught this, uh, you mentioned lavender, was that lavender oil, or can you specify that? I'm trying to find the uh, question. It's, in that, it's I, I use Chelsea products, the uh, oil, it's the lavender brush cleaner is what I use, but they also have their mediums and such, and uh, no, that's not it, spike lavender oil. Spike lavender is a little different than uh, more expensive than the regular brush cleaner. But uh, here's, here's lavender brush cleaner. Right here. Okay. Okay. Anyway, this is this is a safer natural solvent for oil painting, non-toxic, no carcinogenic fumes, no petroleum, no turpentine. So oh. uh, that's that's a good thing. And uh, I basically discovered it. Now, it's, uh, it's got a very strong fragrance. It's, it's lavender. If you like lavender, you've got no problems. But they also have one that's made with citrus. So it's got uh, it's a very strong uh, brush cleaner as well. Uh, it's just that uh, I like the lavender. Okay, the, very, cool. very practical question here. How do you keep the paper towel from breaking apart and adhering to the canvas? Or do you that's use a great. special paper towel? You... <laughs> Actually, these are paper towels that my wife doesn't like because they they are big old full sheet ones. Anyway, no, there no there's no special paper towels. It's not as wet looking as you. The first thing you saw down going wet was wet, but this watch this. See that it's not coming off. It's oh. already drying. Okay. So it's it's drier than it appears. Uh, that's what I'm saying. When, when if you like right now. If I wanted to get off to really light colors, 
then I've got to really either bear down hard or use some Gamsol to, to activate it again. Getting it wet. To get it wet again. Oh, okay, so it's a very, a very workable medium at yes. this stage. Yeah. In, in oils, it is. In oils. <laughs> and then yeah, when you... Not as far as the words ask that yet. No, no, no acrylic questions yet. And but when you're applying, when you start applying the pigment, do you start with the shadows, with the darks? It depends. Sometimes, uh, I generally when I when I start painting after this stage, I will work from uh, what's furthest away, and come forward. So, like if it's in one of the course things, I'm going to paint in the sky, background blue. Then I may paint. Uh, I may sometimes I do midtones first, and uh, then some darks, or add some more. And I try to hold off on the highlights because you know colors are relative. You start getting these midtones in place, then you can tell how much of those highlights you need and where they need to be done. So, uh, and then as you like, the sky is done, or it doesn't have to be done. Just has to be blocked in mm -hmm. and clo closer to where it needs to be. Then as you move forward, you get to the background. Back here where the trees are going to be, the background trees, and, and as you move forward, trees, 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 and you, until you get all the way to the foreground where you're, there's grasses and this water. Now, because there's a reflection, sometimes I will add, I will go ahead and block in whatever's at, at that area because sometimes it's the, the reflection colors of the units you know, reflecting. So if you've got the color there, use it. So, anyway. This is a, this is one long one, but this particular uh, yeah, you'll paint this sometimes, and sometimes it's like, why is this taking so long to get ready? You'll go and tr apply it with a dry paper towel, and it comes off pure white. And other times, like today, it's like drying fast. So, which is good. I, I like fast, uh, but normally you have more work working time. And if it, like I said, it's if it's doing that, you just, you know do the best you can. Come in with a little bit of uh, Gamsol to get those lighter cut, lighter values, and you're good to go. See if you can so the the audience has been baited. Okay, acrylic question. Ah, do you, finally. <laughs> do you use the same technique with acrylics? Apply dry, blot, blend, or would you use wet on wet when using acrylics? It's a good question, but let me see that painting again. This this actually is an a painting. It is, a, is an acrylic on the painting. This is the same, basically. It's everything's reversed. Okay. Anyway, the, the gist is you have to work really darn fast with acrylics. And you more than likely these days you can use some sort of retarder in with the paint and slow it down a little bit so you do have more time to rub out things. Uh, but it's the same technique. But it's the same technique, basically. Uh, when I did it with acrylics, uh, I will use a spray bottle to keep the whole thing active so that the area that's trying to dry on me, I'll slow it down a little bit and, and then be able to rub out what I need to do and then move on. But you really have to work fast if you're not using some sort of retarding um, medium of some kind. Uh, and larger, yeah, larger, it gets harder. Small is not so hard. But when you start doing large paintings, you're going to have a harder time. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, I'm not going to, if this, if I stopped right now on this, no big deal. I'd go into it later and paint and have no problems at all. And very often on some paintings, like it's a big, big cloudscape, I may not even do the bottom part at all. I may just do the vista mm -hmm. part on the top part and then just use one. This is an old one. Oh, cool. See that or not? But you can see the darker areas were laid in with pretty much just a little bit darker value. And this one did not have a lot of detail in it. I think this was done at a, I don't know. As you can see the blues in there. And this is actually a painting that I started and never, never finished because it was for some competition. I don't remember but the subject. So I had to rather paint this stuff than that stuff. That was actually, that was going to be Michelangelo's villa or something. So uh, someday I'll finish it. I don't have very many unfinished paintings around. Hmm? So 
this is about what it needs to be. I think, uh, oh, let's see. Yeah, the history of Teachable for me. Teachable was a big, uh, was a really big thing for us. Uh, about three years ago, this month, we opened our first course. And then we started our online school for painters. And to believe it or not, uh, it wasn't my idea. Sandra would say, Lane, you should teach this stuff. And I said, I don't have anything to teach. Everybody knows this stuff. And the more, the more and more I saw online and, and, and I came to realize that, well, not everybody knows this stuff, especially some stuff like this. And so Painting Dramatic Clouds was the very first one. And believe it or not, more than, gosh, 1,100 artists have, have enrolled. It's a lot. And uh, we're going to have more courses. Uh, we have several courses now, some master classes, and there's going to be more coming. Um, but the cloud course is a really good introductory course for learning about how to paint clouds and, and learning to paint in layers, really. It's not a very intimidating course. It's not a very large painting. Of course, if you paint it, you can paint it larger if you want. But uh, I think it's a very, uh, what's the right word? It's a, it's a good one to start with sometimes because it introduces you to painting in layers. You're not just, I remember in a workshop once, I was trying to teach this and I was walking around and there was one particular lady that was, uh, she had more experience painting, but she was a plein air painter. And she was just throwing paint, thick paint at the canvas. I'm going, no, no. It's so learning how to paint in layers is, th you know, you're painting thin layers and building up the painting. And the old master just did it this way, you know, Rembrandt painted like this, uh, Raphael painted like this, uh, Titian painted like this. So the thing is, it's a good way to learn. And right now there's a special offer for everyone. Normally uh, the course is the uh, cloud course is normally uh, 139, but it's gonna be $99 for the next week. So is there anything else? Anything special you got some goodies here at the end and uh you know you got if you learn to look at clouds i can look at clouds now and still try to figure out how in the heck is it doing that and sometimes you can figure it out sometimes it's like you can't it's but it's the way it is and uh you know to be able to understand the clouds, I think is really important to be able to paint them better. And, uh, you know, to be able to paint oils is really a, an ideal thing for painting clouds because you have, with oils, you can paint hard edges and you can paint soft edges. And soft edges are sometimes the bane of a lot of people. So anyway, how much time do we have left? We are, how much time do we have left, gentlemen? Uh, we got about like seven, 10 more minutes. Uh, if okay. anyone, if anyone watching still has questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. And Lane, do you want to keep keep working away a little on that? I will work away, and I'll answer whatever anybody asks me. So, yeah, it's weird because my reference is back here, so I have to look back towards it. Yeah, and then maybe I, I can ask you a couple questions while you're going here about the course. Is the course like a work at your own pace? Is it a limited amount of time? What, how how does what's the student experience going through the course? The student experience that we've gotten through feedback has been phenomenal. Uh, it, is at your own it is at your own pace. You take your time. There's nobody over your shoulder telling you, "Oh, mine's better than yours," or "That's look like mine." Or lifetime. there's no pressure, and it's a lifetime. You get it the course as long as it's you know as you need it. As long as the internet's there. As long as the internet's there. So as long as long yeah. <laughs> clouds clouds might be around yeah, longer great. but yeah yeah no but, I, it's, yeah. it's a great i mean it's a great way to do it because I mean, it, the, you'll be painting in the course and you may have to stop in it and then you'll come back later and you're right back where you were you don't, you don't have to go finding something on a cd or something like that it's a really good experience and uh it's a like i said if you look at the course structure it's 
you can see where you're going. You can see how far you've come and you can see how far you've got to go. Uh, I mean, even on the last course, I mean, I think in the middle of it, I, or early, I said, you know, a painting like this, you can stop right now if you want to, because it looks, the basics of this are good, but I'm going to take it a little bit further. So again, I'm going to teach you, you know, whether you want to or not, or if you, if you think your painting's fine the way it is, then you're, then you're happy. And that's the whole point of it. I, I want people to be happy when they're painting, not fighting what they're doing because they don't understand something. So the more you get to experience and I'm talking about experience failures too. Failures are teaching things. So, but the, the thing is, you have to take what you learned and apply it to the next painting. And or if you want to, wipe it away. So. And, and the experience is similar to this. They're looking over your shoulder. Yeah, uh, the experience from the course is you're you're seeing the painting. Much higher quality though. <laughs> and higher quality yeah. video. So yeah, we're doing our little our new webcam, and we got a new satellite. So yeah. 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 Well, and also, I posted the link in the chat as well to go check out your Instagram where everything is just clean and so beautiful. Uh, and it's so cool to see you see you paint on there. Since we first talked like a few months ago, I've been watching you, watching you go. And it's just absolutely, it's magic to me because I see you doing like you are now this highlight this highlight and then just out of nowhere everything all the sun ties together and it's like how the heck did he do that but uh I did want you're talking about you were talking about music earlier and you know you mm -hmm. get right better and stuff because you do it more of it in art I call it BIC button chair time you got to spend the time <laughs> hanging, failing yeah. maybe Fail faster and you'll paint better. So no, right. you, the more you do something, and your if your heart is is on on that, then you're going to learn. You're going to learn, and uh, the more successes you get from those things. I will look back at my own paintings from years and years ago and just oh, was, at the time I remember this is really great. This is just a fantastic painting. And look back at it now, it's like mm -hmm. so. That, I think that's probably a lot of people's experiences in their painting uh, in their journey is that you do it's, it's this constant journey it's a constant journey you're always going to be painting and painting more and getting better and better and i just want you to be happy while you're doing it and not battling your journey because you don't understand the right way to do something and mm -hmm. uh, there's always more so. there was a question about subtitles on this. yes you does know, your course have English. subtitles subtitles we do english. awesome yes. in english english, english so right. Interestingly, though, we have a student who's in Portugal, and she said when she did the translate page, it translated to Portuguese. Yeah. Oh, wow. This up up. Yeah. So, I mean, I can't see that, but she she told us it works. So that was really. I, awesome. You know, I I just hope more and more things. You know, technology is giving us more and more really cool things. I hope they continue in that vein. Not the silly, stupid things, but the things that are making things better. You know, if Instagram, you know, an Instagram, if people make make a comment in Portuguese in, in in my feed, I can't even copy it to translate it. But right. other parts of Instagram have translations. It's like, well, why is yeah. so? Hopefully, <laughs> it's right somebody's asking acrylics, can they follow along in acrylics in their courses? Yes, yes. Uh, if you paint in acrylics, uh, you can. Uh, Follow along, and of course, the, pro, the, the approach is the same. There are several acrylic painters in the oh, students. A lot of acrylic painters. A lot of, yes. okay. a lot of acrylic painters, and the, the principles are the same. For example, if you're if you're doing the course uh, uh, painting realistic depth, which is I, I think is one of my best courses, you know the concepts are the same. You're going to learn the concepts to create real depth in the painting that will apply whether it's oil or acrylic. Not as much water. The, the concepts apply, but the this, this techniques do not apply as much in watercolor, but the concepts do. So uh, I spent a lot of time to really take everything from my mind to the, the things that I don't think about. I, I don't think about doing this. I just do it. So I have to, when I make a course, I have to decipher what I'm trying to teach mm. so that somebody can learn from it. Uh, I've always said, you know, design and composition is one of those things that uh, you can learn the basics of, but to get really good at it where you don't even think about what you're doing, you just, it takes time and it takes us for you to acquire a sense of that. 
And that's, unfortunately, I think that's been my experience over time. Mm -hmm. And uh, painting has a lot of similarities in the same way. You'll get better the more you do it. So Yeah. And we got make the teaching experience fun. So. Right. <laughs> And before uh, before we wrap up, just for time's sake, I got a couple more questions I think are really valuable. Uh, how do you know, and you kind of brushed on this a little bit earlier, but how do you know when you're officially done with a painting? Do you have to stop yourself from adding too many details? That's one thing. Or if it's at the gallery and it's sold, then it's out of your hands. So, uh, <laughs> no, it, it is. One, this is a really good question, and I have a technique that I use that will help me finish a painting because you do, you get to the end and you're just going all over the place trying to figure out, do I need to do this? Do I need to do that? So right towards the end of a painting, maybe the last two days, I will come out in the studio first thing in the morning and I'll sit down with the pad and paper and I will look at it and I'll take notes on what needs to be finished, what needs to be adjusted. These are final, final things. What thing, what needs to be changed? What needs all the final things to, yeah, if you, if you have a new house, you have a punch list, all these things that the builder has to fix before you take ownership of the house. Mm -hmm. Same principle on the painting. You have to fix or adjust or do all these things, check them off, and then you're done. Hmm. Walk away. It's not that you don't come back. But I come back later and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I come back the builder's not there and say, I want to fix this. <laughs> no, it's, 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 that's a technique I use, and it does help you complete a painting, I think. Love it. Well, Lane, I, we have to wrap up just for time's sake. And for everyone watching, we appreciate you hanging out with us. And Lane, appreciate you coming and showing us this this magical way just to like jump ahead in your painting. I love it so much. And please, everyone, hop in the chat. Thank you for being so active in there. And thank Lane for his time. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe to the Discover channel. And Thanks, Lane, before we, yeah. yeah, before we totally part, I just, I like to ask one last question, which is just kind of like, if we're going to leave everyone with a little nugget before the day is out, but if you're, you know, it seems like most of this community here is very active. They're already painting. They're already on that journey, but as mm -hmm. they're, I, from my own experience in art and others, I know as well, there's, there's these points, no matter where you're at in mastery, where you reach a roadblock. And it can take years to maybe break through that block. And then it can take, you know, a month where you figure it out. But at that point yeah. where you notice that you're in this roadblock stage, from your experience, do you have any advice just for getting through that or working through that? Or what do you do when you're you're in a place like that? Uh, I'm blessed that I'm not in that position very often. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm painting nature. So if I'm in a spot where I'm not snapping to what I need to be doing right, I go out and get in nature. Go know, I go look at yeah. things. Yeah. I go explore. And every, like you said, everybody's in a different location in their journey, I think. And it's really helpful to be, um, to realize that you are where you are right now. And, and, you're there for a reason. Yeah, so if you want to get better, you know, you just have to persevere, you know, pra practice, patience, and time are all you need. And don't be so hard on yourself. A lot of people re get really hard on themselves and they quit. And I just can't understand that you know, if you're, you're there to have fun while you're doing this. If it stops being fun, you need to stop doing it. So I think <laughs> if you get in a bind, step away. If you, you know, it depends on the bind you're in. You know, if I'm, I'm in a position where I don't know how something looks really in a certain way, I'll, I'll go take it and look at it in front of a mirror or I'll turn it upside down if I want to check mm. the composition. I will see all these various little workarounds to, to just look at it differently. And of course, I always tell uh, students that if you can find somebody, and they don't have to be an artist, but somebody that has a good eye that can look at something and say, this needs some help. This I don't know what it is, but right here something's not working. Uh, that those are good people. Criticism is good. It helps you learn and get better. The worst thing, if you're trying to get better, is if you have everybody telling you your work is just beautiful, so everything's perfect. You don't need to do anything, and you know there's something. So you need to find the person that can be honest with you, and mm -hmm. and in a good way, tell you, oh, what about this or what about that. 
And uh, if you, you can find that person, you, you've got gold. So mine's sitting over there. So she's, <laughs> she's brutal. She's brutal sometimes, though. <laughs> but that helps. That helps in growth, right? How do we growth without the brutal honesty? Yes, it does. Yeah. She, yes, she's really good. So anyway, uh, I hope that helps. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody, it, you know, just continue learning. It's a, it's a journey, and it should be a learning journey all your life. So. Yeah. Well, for everybody watching. Again, thank you for joining us for this learning experience. You can grab Lane's course. It'll be on that discount just for a week. And it is in the comments. It is in the description. And it'll also be emailed to you. Once again, Lane, thank you so much for your time and everybody for joining us. And oh, resource bundle. Oh, yeah. Something about a resource bundle. Oh. Yes, I can drop, and we will send this in the email as well, but I will drop a resource bundle in the comments for you all, which Lane has provided with some additional resources. Do you want to tell us quickly what's in there? I have no idea. I just go where the, I just go where fearless leader tells me to go. <laughs> well, there's some great... It's the e-book is the biggie because the e-book will explain the science behind this. And uh, it'll also show you other things that are not quite like this. It'll show you more on underpainting kind of things. There's like four different things. Yeah. Is there a composition okay. thing in there? Uh, four? Yes. Yeah, there's something on composition too. So. Okay. Yeah. So resources. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again, Lane. And we hope to see you again soon. Everybody who joined us, thank you. And we'll see you all soon. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Nice to, nice to be with you.